points forward. It's our new chapter this week. So thanks again, Lord Joey, for filling in last week. Uh, if you recall from our previous study, we included chapter 3, seeing how the God justifies us through faith, and how the God does not just completely thrown out the law, but there's still a purpose for it, even under the New Covenant. Amen. We begin chapter 4 with Abraham being justified by faith. Well, the Lord will cover the first five verses a day. Here Paul writes, What shall we say then, that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and was counted him for righteousness. Amen. And to him that worketh it is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. Here, Paul, knowing that there would be some objectors to what he has previously said, he said, what shall we say then? If you begin to address this objection, the that one is not justified by the works of the law, but rather by faith. And he shows that even Abraham was justified by faith. He says that Abraham, our father, has pertained to the flesh. You know, Abraham was the father or the progenitor, if you will, of the Israelites, the Jews as we call them, the, Amen. as well as the Ishmaelites through Hagar and several others through Keturah. But Paul, being a Jew, is speaking from the perspective of a Jew here, and he says that Abraham was their father according to the flesh, and you know, the Jews were very proud of that. Mm -hmm. and oftentimes they would say, well, we have Abraham as our father, but yet that in and of itself doesn't matter much for salvation. Mm -hmm. But he goes to show here that even Abraham was not justified by the works of the law or by good works. He says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father has obtained the flesh hath found? What what type of salvation did Abraham find? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, 8. Amen. And Abraham found a very same type of salvation. Even though it's not said in those exact same words. Mm -hmm. If you'll notice throughout the scriptures, faith is always the key. Mm -hmm. Going on verse 2, he says, For if Abraham were justified by works, as we've clearly seen in the previous chapter, no one, including Abraham, can be justified by the works inside of God. In Romans 3 and 20 tells that very plainly. Galatians 2, 16, Galatians 3, 11, all very clearly state that man cannot be justified by works in the sight of God. So neither of them could Abraham, even though he was the father of the Jews, even though he was a man called out by God, to, and he was used in a great way, but yet Abraham was not justified by his own works either. Amen. Because for if Abraham were justified by works, he has where of the glory. Yeah. That is, he would have room to boast or brag about what his works and what he has done. But that's exactly what a natural man will do. Amen. That's why we're told in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that it's by grace are you saved through faith and then not of works. If it wasn't works, he says, lest any man should boast. Amen. <laughs> because man would certainly boast about it if he had anything to that he could add to anything that he could do to justify himself. Well, he says that if he were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, mm -hmm. but not before God. That is, Abraham had no room to boast of his good works before God. And yet, do we have any room to boast before God? We have no room to glory in and of ourselves, anything that we have done. His works could not justify him, neither can our works justify us. Really, as we'll see as we go throughout this chapter here, that 
Abraham is the pattern for salvation that comes really for everyone who is saved after them. Amen. So there's a lot of debate about who was saved in the period between Adam and Moses. And there's some arguments to be made that only a few were saved, but maybe we'll get into that later in chapter 5. I believe he brings that up. But we know for sure Abraham was saved by God. Yet it wasn't by his own doing. Amen. Rather, even though Abraham lived a fairly pious life, especially compared to the world in which we live today, mm -hmm. yet that could not save him. That could not justify him in the sight of God. You know, there's many today that seem to think that they're going to, by their moral living, they're going to be right before God. Well, I know Abraham had his faults. He wasn't exactly honest about who Sarah was on multiple occasions. Right. He took the word of Sarah and took it to Hagar's wife over the trusting in God and his promise. But yet he other times exemplified great faith and he yeah. he God told him to get up and go to the land where I'll show you and he'd get up and went without questioning God. Of course he brought love along with him, which I don't think he was supposed to do. Right. And then when the promised son was born, Isaac, later on, God would tell him to go up there and offer him yeah. on Mount Moriah. And he didn't say, well, God, why should I do that? Or why did you give me the son just to sacrifice him? But no. He says he went believing, knowing that God could raise him back from the dead again. Amen. So Abraham showed much greater faith than I think many of us would. Mm -hmm. But yet, none of that, none of those good works, none of those things he did could justify himself. So we ought not to think that we can somehow do good works and stand before God and say, look at all these good works I have, God. Mm -hmm. Even if Abraham himself could not be justified by the works, neither can we. Right. I think this, not before God, is key to understanding the supposed contradiction between Paul and James. Let's turn over there to James for just a moment. James chapter 2. We'll come back to this later in our lesson here. But if you're familiar with the book of James, it's largely about works. About how that we are to have works. You know, so we'll touch on that towards the end of the lesson here. But in verse 21, in particular, he brings out. Example of Abraham. I thought it interesting that Martin Luther thought the book of James should even be in the canon scripture. Right. He got a few things right, but he was off on a lot of other things. Right. So the book of James is difficult for some to understand because it's really not that difficult when you understand it in context. Right. Verse 21 of James 2 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? The difference that, between what James and what Paul is writing, James is not saying that he was justified before God by his works, but I believe he's saying before the eyes of men he was justified. Right. Paul is speaking of justification in the sight of God. So as the rest of the chapter bears out here, he's talking about faith and works and the relationship that they have. And we, we can have faith, but we don't have works. He says it's dead being alone. That's in verse 20 of chapter 2. And as he says in another place, that it doesn't do us any good to see someone in need, tell them you you're warm and filled, and not give them the things that they need. Yeah. A man cannot see our faith like God can see our faith. Man right. cannot see yeah. our works. Our works should be the, the evidence or the, the result of our faith. But don't confuse that works aren't what justifies in the sight of God. But it is what shows our justification in the sight of men. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to our text here in Romans. 
Romans chapter 4, verse 3, he says, For what saith the scripture? As Paul is quoting from Genesis 15, verse 6, where he, Abraham given the promise of God, and he said he believed the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And here Paul quotes that and he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. As Abraham believed God, his faith was really all that was required. Mm -hmm. So I said this particular instance was referring to the promised seed that was come through, come through him and through Isaac and Jacob, and really that promised seed was ultimately Christ. Mm -hmm. We see that brought out in the book of Galatians. Yet he had faith in that promise. He had faith that God was would be faithful to his promises, and yet he says that's all he needed for righteousness, not Amen. that he needed a bunch of good works. If you know Paul's Jewish audience, oftentimes were very self-righteous, very yeah. caught up in keeping the law for righteousness' sake. Even right. Paul himself was that way before he was converted. Yet he brings out here that even how that Abraham was not justified by those works, but rather by faith in God. So it is for us today that we are not righteous before God because of our own doing, but rather we are righteous because of faith in Him. It's counted unto Him for righteousness. Accounted also means imputed. And it's used that way throughout the chapter here. That it's God places his righteousness on our account. In that. That's what it means to be counted unto us for righteousness. Abraham had faith in God. God placed his righteousness on Abraham's account, just like we have through Christ. If we have faith in Christ, he says he our sins are taken and imputed unto him, and his righteousness is imputed unto us. Amen. That is the difference between what Abraham had and what we have. I believe in many ways salvation has not changed, but in some ways there are differences. Faith is really the, the key to salvation throughout all of scriptures. Certainly God has to give his grace as well. We see all the way back to Noah. In that. We see even grace and mercy extended to Adam and Eve in the garden. Yet, Christ had not made a sacrifice yet, so Abraham could not have his sins completely removed until that occurred in time. Amen. Yet, he, it still says that he had the righteousness of God accounted to his account. And that has not changed through, throughout time, that God counts our faith for righteousness. That's where the Jews got miserably wrong that they thought they had to keep the law for righteousness. But, and that's where so many today in their works based salvation get it wrong. They think they have to do enough good works to be acceptable in the sight of God. Right. But yet, we just like Abraham will simply have faith in God and he will count it for righteousness. And when I say all that, it doesn't excuse us from works. Mm -hmm. That's. I think we'll see that when we go back to James again. But going on to verse 4 and 5 here, he gives an argument why it's of grace and not of works. He says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. You know, him that worketh, that's those who seek to be justified by their works or to earn salvation through works. He says, It's not, the reward is not reckoned of grace. It's, Grace and works cannot mix. I'd uh, say they are more separate than oil and water are. Amen. You can't have it both ways. You can only have it works for grace and not one or the other. That's yeah. brought out in chapter 11 of Romans. Let me turn there real quick. Romans 11, verse 6. Here he is speaking of election, particularly the election of the women of Israel, but 
Verse number 6, he says, If by grace, then it is no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but to be a works, and it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Amen. It seems like a mouthful, but also it's very simple. It's, it's either with grace or it's a works. It can't be both. Amen. If you want salvation by works, then you need to forget about grace. If you want salvation by grace, then you need to forget about works. And we're strictly talking about how we are saved, not about our life after salvation. Right. We are not saved by works. We are saved by grace. As mm -hmm. very, very evident in the scriptures, we get so many today still want to cling to their works for salvation. There's so many they say, yes, I believe it's salvation by grace, but then they say, well, I got to hold out faithful. Right. Well, if you have to keep your salvation, then you didn't have the grace of God to begin with. Amen. If you have to earn your salvation, then it's not of the grace of God. If you have to do really anything besides simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's not of the grace of God, and therefore it's of works. And Paul says here that it's, it's not of works, but it's of death. That is, if you're working to earn your salvation, you're working to pay off your sin debt, and that's a debt you can't pay. Amen. You know, it's like almost like making the minimum payments on the credit card that you have maxed out, you'll never be able to pay it. But even more so with sin, you just compound interest upon interest. Right. So if you are trying to work your way toward salvation, you will be trying to dig yourself out of a hole that's getting deeper and faster than you can dig. Yeah. yeah. But that's exactly how, how many today are look at salvation and say, well, if I'm a good enough person, if I do this or I do that, then when I hope, or some of you go far and say, well, I hope if I do this or do that, when I stand before the pearly gates, God will let me in. But, hmm. well, there's nothing true about any of that, but no, we should, it should be a great a great relief to us that salvation is of grace and not of works. Amen. And really how anyone could could read any bit of scriptures and say that it's of works that boggles my mind, but yet I know that they are blinded, spiritually speaking. And the flesh just, for whatever reason, loves to have his good works. Mm -hmm. The flesh just wants to do something to right. be acceptable before God, and yet there is nothing he can do. As Paul argues here to the Jews that if Abraham himself couldn't be justified by his own good works, neither can we. But to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. Verse 5, he contrasts that, and he says, but to him that worketh not. And so these are those who are not working on their salvation. He so said, doesn't excuse us from good works, but he's speaking of being justified in the sight of God, that him that worketh not will leave on him that justifies the ungodly. Now, who is that justifies the ungodly? It's not myself, it's not you, it's not Brother Larry or whoever your pastor may be, if you're right on the internet, it's not the Pope, it's not Pope the Church, no, it is God who justifies the ungodly. We see this very clearly in chapter 3, verse 24 through 26. We can read that real quick for a reminder. Where he says, I'll just go and read verse 23. He says, For all those sin come short of the glory of God. Amen. So all are ungodly. Verse 24, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And that is through Christ and really by God's own good pleasure that he justifies the ungodly. So he says here, to him that believeth 
on him that justifies the ungodly. And we have to believe more than there just is a God, but is your faith in what God has promised and that what Christ has accomplished? The devils also believe in tremble. That right. James says there's a lot of people out there who believe there is a God. Most every religion believes in some sort of God. Yeah, do you believe in the God of the Bible, the same God that Abraham served? Right. The one who justifies the ungodly? Many today are serving a God who justifies those who have enough good works. Justify those who are members of a certain church, whether it be the Catholic Church, or there's even some Baptists that say you have to be a Baptist to be saved. Mm. You know, the Church of Christ thinks they're the only ones that are going to get it right. But right. Nor do you believe on him that justifies the ungodly. That is the only way to have righteousness before God. As he says in the next part of our text here, but believeth on the un but him that believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. Be just as Abraham was, so it is for us that our faith will be counted for righteousness. And that's the only way that I find to have righteousness in the sight of God is by faith in Christ. Then he takes that righteousness and applies it to our account. And every believer has the righteousness of Christ applied to his account. And on the same hand that Every believer has his sin taken from his account applied to the account of Christ. And Christ bore that for us on the cross. And Amen. But now we can stand in the sight of God completely free from sin and righteous. I don't, sometimes I don't know that we fully comprehend what that all entails. Yes, we still struggle with sin in this life. Yes, we still struggle sometimes with serving Him or falling to sin. But as far as when we stand before God, whether we have, whether we are righteous or whether we are sinners, will matter not about what we have done, but rather if we have faith in Christ or not. Amen. Let's turn real quick to Philippians, and then we'll go to James. Scripture, but I always like what Paul says here. And we had it three brags about all that he had in the flesh, or he said all things he could brag about in the flesh. Uh, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, he was circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness within the law, blameless. Verse 7 he says, But what things were gained to me, I, those I counted lost for Christ. Notice verse 9 he says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. He, Paul himself desired to have the righteousness of Christ. Should we not desire the same thing? Paul, concerning the law, was, as he says here, blameless, but yet, in the sight of God, he was still guilty. Mm -hmm. So it is today, you can be very moral and upstanding, you can have a very good reputation on men, you can, you could really, you could quote the scriptures from front to back, you could attend church every service, and yet, if you don't have the righteousness of Christ applied to you, you've never had faith in him, then it won't matter when you stand before God. That's right. You can do all the good works you want, but that will never save you. You can even be the pastor of a church or the Sunday school teacher or hold a position of notoriety and yet none of those things will do you good in the sight of God. You're right. But none of this excuses us from our works after the Lord saves us. Let's turn back to James and we'll see that real quick before we close here.
who, like I said, Paul's audience there was primarily the self-righteous Jews. I think James is dealing more with those who said they had faith and yet didn't do anything in the service for God. Seems to be many professing Christians today. He is not saying that we need works to save us, but we will have works because we are saved. James chapter 2. Verse number 20 is where he says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So we must have works. We can't just say, I have faith, and not show them by our works. Verse number 17 he says, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yeah, Verse 18, yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Amen. See, faith, works cannot produce faith any more than faith can not produce works. If you understand what I mean? The works do not come, faith does not come by works, but works come by faith. Amen. Verse number 15, he says, If a brother or sister be naked, destitute, destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding, and give not them. Or give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Right. It doesn't do any good to say you have faith if you don't sh show any evidence of it. <laughs> That's why I have lots of questions about people who say they're saved and then never live for God. Mm hmm. Amen. I understand we can get people get involved in sin, people can do things that they shouldn't do and maybe drift away for a time, but. Those who seem to go away and never have any chastisement, never have any desire to return, I have a big question about if they were ever truly born of God. Right. Amen. Because faith, real saving faith, will drive you to serve God. As James clearly says here that you have a dead faith if you don't have any words. You have a faith that's doing nothing for you. And it does no good to say you have faith and then not do anything about it. Mm -hmm. He brings out verse number 19, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe in truth. Right. The devil, they believe there is a God, but just believing there is a God is not sufficient, is it? Amen. I mentioned earlier, there may that believe there is a God. There's a difference between believing that and believing in the God of the Bible, even more so in believing and trusting, if I could say it that way, in Christ and what He has accomplished. But just the same as it does no good to go up to a freezing homeless person on the park bench and say, well, hope you are all right. It doesn't do us any good to have faith and not have works. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> right. And yet there are seems to be two two extremes today among Christians or professing Christians, and one is that they trust putting all their trust in their works and what they are doing, and that they have no faith, no real saving faith that is. And then you have the others that are say, "Oh yes, I have faith," and they're not doing anything in the service for God. And yet neither of those are. Compatible with what the scriptures say we ought to do. Amen. I'm going to read us one more place and then we'll close. Uh, Titus. I'm going to someone knows Titus. Chapter number two. We'll begin verse number 11. He says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Amen. We see here at the beginning that the same grace of God that brings salvation teaches us 
that we are to deny ungodliness, that we are to deny worldly lust, that we are to live soberly, that we are to live righteously, we are to live godly. You, certainly, it's good to be in a good sound church that has good teaching with if the grace of God will teach you how you ought to live in this world. Amen. And he says that Christ gave himself to, to redeem us from iniquity and purify himself of healer people zealous of good works. Christ died, he said that he might, we might be zealous of good works. That's one of the problems with uh, what we call fire escape theology. God, right. Jesus came to save you from hell, and that's certainly a part of it, but that is not the whole of the gospel by any means. Amen. Not only did he save us from our sin, he, he enabled us to do good works for him. We are to have our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Oh, seeing how the Christ has done so much for us, it ought to drive us to serve him. Amen. We had, on the other hand, back to the theme of our text in Romans 4, that those works are not what save us. Those works aren't what keep us saved. But it's God which justifies the ungodly. Amen. It's God which imputes righteousness to us through faith in Christ. And it's only through that justification that we can stand right before God. So, Certainly, if you're not saved here, all I can do is point you to Christ and what He has accomplished. Amen. And if you are saved, saved, I can exhort you to serve God and do good works, for that is what we are called to do as His people. <laughs> but ultimately, trust in Christ and what He has done more than anything else. Amen. We're willing to look at what David has to say next week about this. He wrote about it in the Psalms. How it's a blessed privilege to have the righteousness of God imputed to us without works. Amen. Close with that thought.